when you started? Um, probably started dabbling with graffiti around the time I was 11 years old. I was in the sixth grade. Um, copied some of the graffiti I saw in the staircases and in my neighborhood and just started doodling and trying to write my name fancy. Um, what, were you, what was like going through your head? Where, where you are now, you're kind of considered a graffiti legend and you get to travel around a bit and you're, I guess, you're commissioned to do work and stuff like that. When you were just starting out, were you, did you have any of this in your mind that it could lead to this kind of stuff or were you hoping it would or what was the kind of vibe back then? There really wasn't any plan for uh, me to turn the corner as an adult and hold on to graffiti. Um, there wasn't necessarily a next level to take your craft when I was growing up. Um, I didn't grow up with computers and you know uh, graphic design and uh, you know maybe mural painting weren't viable options at the time. There was no market or demand for it. So. Uh, you know, but um, I wrote graffiti and I kind of figured that just like most guys that end up quitting at some point after a couple of years and moving on with my life and uh, you know, I've taken a break from graffiti during my life but um, it's always been a part of something I've done, it's been with me and I was able to at some point turn the corner as an adult and continue to work on fun graffiti related projects. So uh, this is September, we'll mark 20 years of relatively consistent graffiti work from publishing, well it's actually 20 years of consistent print, but primarily uh, covering graffiti. Um, and uh, you know, over the years, graffiti's probably presented me with options that I just, or opportunities that I couldn't have possibly imagined the first time. And, and again, many of these things were opportunities that just didn't exist when I was a kid. There's a market for it now, and you know, I was from a generation of do-it-yourself kids and we created our own markers and we made our own fat caps and our own train keys and you know even our own ink and you know now there are people that sell this stuff and it's, it's a legitimate business in 2013 so uh, you know things have changed considerably since then and now but to answer your question no I, had, I would have had would, couldn't have possibly imagined still being involved in graffiti at this stage in my life Hmm. And what, what was the key, what year was sort of the key year of the flip where it became, it went from being just sort of an underground uh, scene to really being embraced, uh, being, uh, say, the art world embraced it or other things like that, or it became commercially viable? Well, I think there were different search, uh, you know, um, there were different moments where graffiti seemed to be um, surfacing from the train tunnel to the art gallery, and I think that they tried to force the hand in that happening in the 70s. Um, in the early 80s, there was sort of this gallery explosion. And, you know, for the most part, those guys, um, you know, guys like Crash, guys like Days, um, Lady Pink, and a host of other guys were, uh, are, are probably still to this day celebrated um, fine artists and continue to make a living off of graffiti. But considering how many people wrote graffiti, and the amount of people who make it in the art world back then that are still relevant to this day are just, you know, it's a very slim margin of folks. And then uh, I think in the 90s there was this, you know, resurgence um, of interest, and it, but there were small pockets of it, you know, we were, in New York City at least, we were just getting away from subway graffiti and it was still too soon to re-embrace. There were a lot of people that were trying to move on with their real lives and get taken seriously, professionally, post-graffiti. Um, and I started covering it um, maybe in 90, uh, I started covering it in 93. My first issue of The Source was September 1993. And uh, I continued to cover it and I noticed that slowly but slowly there were other mainstream magazines that were embracing graffiti. And then at some point it just became a necessary ingredient for lifestyle magazines, you're going to cover hip hop, you'll probably cover fashion, and there's some sort of area devoted to graffiti. But you know, I've been doing it consistently um, from working at the source uh, for 11 years. Uh, I had a column of Paul Graflix that highlighted graffiti from around the world, and we also highlighted graffiti that dated back to as early as 1972. You know, and then we would show stuff that was just painted the month before the issue went to print. So uh, we covered graffiti there. I worked at YRB Magazine for a year as an editor. Um, I have a blog on 12 Ounce Profits where I cover graffiti. 
Um, we've done events around the world. I worked for Belt and Spray Paint for five years, almost five years, and uh, we did fun graffiti events and sponsored graffiti uh, artists, and you know, we're involved in all sorts of fun creative uh, initiatives and projects. And uh, you know, I paint corporate murals on the side. Um, an author, I've published four books on graffiti now. Uh, the first book is called Mascots and Mugs. It's a character study of graffiti. Uh, it it kind of starts with the uh, most basic rudimentary sketch, which is Stay High's uh, stick figure, the smoker. Uh, and then, you know, it just, it's all of the, we highlight all of the artists in the chronological order that have uh, contributed uh, creatively to the uh, character movement in graffiti. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then the uh, three books beyond that are uh, it's a series of books called Peace Book, Peace Book, Peace Book Reloaded, World Peace Book. And we kind of just, uh, it's the fantasy black book of sorts. We've kind of created this fantasy sketchbook. For, uh, aspiring artists. I believe you've been to, to Winnipeg three times now to the Graffiti Gallery. I believe that's how many times you've been here. Uh, what do you make of the Graffiti Gallery? Like, what do you feel? Uh, uh, do you, are you feel like they're contributing in some small way to graffiti culture? Or, Well, you know, um, what I hear a lot of is, hey, I'm a local artist. Um, you know, I'm not like you guys from New York or Los Angeles or whatever. But um, I think your experience is always just relative to where you're at. And, you know, I compare it to baseball all the time. It's like, you can't tell me that the kid that's sliding into, uh, you know, homemade, you know, from a garbage top home base in the back lot of a abandoned field isn't having as much fun as the guy that's getting paid to do it professionally during, you know, the final game of the World Series. Like... And it's just, you know, I always try and tell people don't minimize your experience or where you're from. It's all relative to your experience. And, uh, you know, it's its, own, it's its own ecosystem. And it's just, you know, just a smaller pond maybe. You know, but it's, just, it, it's subject to the same issues we have on a much larger scale. And, but what Pat is doing here is very important, you know. And you don't always see the uh, fruit of your labor immediately. But there are, you know, community of people that have come through these doors, that have walked away inspired, or just very different people. And, and you know, when someone can kind of drop a gem on you and, and, and open you up to new things at such a young point in your life, I mean, so many of the people that come through here at, their, at this age where they can either go this way or that way, but with a little bit of structure and, 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 and having options on the table in front of you, is this key because without these programs, you know, um, idle hands, the devil's playground, I don't know, but you know, you, you can really set yourself up for all sorts of trouble. So uh, what Pat's doing here is a uh, very important, um, it serves a very important function and, uh, and it's one of the reasons why I enjoy coming here and, and kind of working with people and, you know, talking to some of the uh, younger aspiring artists and you know, I do workshops in New York City um, with the Department of Probation. I donate some time there for first and second time graffiti offenders. And, uh, you know, I was that kid once that was in trouble for graffiti. And, you know, the game has changed considerably, and so have the rules. And it wasn't a felony charge when I was a kid, and it is now. So if I can help someone avoid the trouble, but services like these are very important. And, you know, there's going to be some a community of people out there that will approach Pat maybe another 10, 20 years from now, and they're going to thank him for being the human that they've turned out to be, and it's probably because of something that they experienced here at the gallery. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a very important, it serves a very important function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the, I, I noticed in an interview you were talking about the post 9 11 uh, situation. Could you just maybe, just maybe do a short little uh, number on that? Yeah, um, you know, New York right now is second to London in surveillance. So we've got cameras everywhere. We're a very busy city. Um, when I was a kid, I could walk into a train tunnel and no one would say anything. But post 9-11, you know, there's surveillance on platforms. And someone walking into a tunnel with a bag in their hand and a hood over their head is just seen very differently. Nobody's thinking, hey, that guy's going to paint the train. You know, um, and it's important to remain vigilant, but um, you know they've really scared lots of people with uh, you know that that's a whole other conversation. But there are you know p 
people aren't as accepting in, in the phrase right now um, that's very common is see something, say something. And uh, people aren't as tolerant. It's a very different New York. You know, a lot of people that lived in New York or that are from New York were pushed out of the community they, they grew up in. And all of these new people that can afford the high rents were introduced to the see something, say something New York. They're far less tolerant of crime, you know, everyone has a cell phone, you know, two guys are taking a photo, someone's videotaping you and the other person's on their phone with 911 calling the police on you. So, you know, the climate just isn't conducive to, you know, when I was a kid and writing Subway Graffiti, New York was in just such a state of disrepair that writing on the trains was such a minuscule, like, in, it was reflected when you got caught because it was a misdemeanor. So you can rack up as many of those as you wanted without having a permanent blemish on your, uh, your, your criminal record. So uh, and now it's a felony. But it, you know, times were just very different back then than they are now. So uh, yeah, but 9-11 really helped change the way people view, you know, criminal mischief and behavior. You know, when that phrase, see something, say something, and condos cost millions of dollars in New York City right now. And, you know, the guy that just spent that amount of money for that apartment doesn't want to see it on his block. And so people are just far less tolerant of New York. But, uh, you know, the surveillance thing really has changed the game. It's very easy to get caught now. There are very few places you can write without uh, being on film.